Thursday. Thank you all for coming today. I know this is a really hectic week for everyone, so thanks for making the time. Um, I'm Casey Blodgett. I'm the club sports coordinator. Some of you already know me. Um, many of you have received many emails from me already this year. Um, but uh, before I start, I just want to introduce uh, a few people who also help make this program possible. Uh, first, Gary Brown, Associate Athletic Director. Um, Megan Flynn, Intramural Coordinator. And Tess Weefer, our new recreation intern this year. Um, you'll be sending Tess all of your new registration forms for this year um, by September 28th, please. Um, and without them, this program really <laughs> couldn't run. Uh, we have 66 club sports this year, so the program just kept, get, keeps getting bigger and bigger, which is awesome. Um, so the primary focus of this presentation is um, to talk about fundraising, uh, best financial practices, and um, <clears throat> just reaching out to alumni and donors, um, trying to get support for the club sports programs. Um, so I'd like to introduce first uh, Tom Murphy from the Harvard Credit Union, and I don't know if Spencer Clark might be assisting as well. Um, and I will give the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so who's attended this session in the past? All right, so you guys are going to actually uh, help participate and put you to work a little bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about just the credit union and just why, what our role is in the student organization accounts, and then give you a little bit of perspective of being a financial manager and kind of the best practices and also what you can learn from this um, for the rest of your life. Because you'll be managing budgets uh, either from your organizations, businesses, and what, and some of the same staple of skills that you're going to learn here, managing this, the accounts here, will be able to value uh, we'll be able to handle it. You'll be able to use it for other organizations. So, um, so the credit union that is the account holder and account processor for all the student organizations across Harvard University, about 900 different organizations between the business schools and the undergraduate organizations as well as the athletic clubs across. And so as a result, there's a lot of standard, a lot of experience we have, best practices. We've seen every problem you can imagine through managing accounts and a lot of positive things. And so hopefully we'll be able to share with you some of the best practices. Um, but I actually want to encourage participation because I find it helpful for those that have been doing it for a while to tell experiences and the rest. And just for your background, the, not, the credit union is, is completely, in, it's federally insured, um, and it's federally, it's a federally managed organization. That means there's that financial support underpinning, uh, unlike some other entities such as PayPal, um, Venmo, and others. I point that out because um, it's become much more of a prevalent issue and potential risk that some individual organizations have that probably aren't even aware of. Um, and because we're completely focused on the Harvard community, it makes it very easy for us to say, what can we do? How can we make programs better and easier um, in meeting the needs? So part of what I hope you also share is some things, what we can do to make it better from your perspective as uh, managers of your club athletics. Um, so for those individuals that have actually done this in the past, tell me, can you share positive aspects of being the CFO or leader of the club athletics? Power. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why? Um, I probably anybody in this room has been in a leadership position. It's a certain type of personality, uh, and uh, some of the reasons why they don't take the way I have to be like Okay. Or at least be the one telling you what the worst have to do. Okay. But the, the main thing I think. So, okay. so that actually goes right <laughs> down into a little bit of set direction. I said the house, but it's actually any of the organizations. Uh, so set the direction, right, for the club. Anything else? Yep. I really enjoyed, we held the tournament for the first time, and I was able to make the entrance fee really low, which meant that we had 65 participants from all different schools and a lot of beginners, rather than just people who would normally pay $100 to go to a jiu-jitsu tournament. And that was set a little bit more of a philosophy from the yeah. going in, from the change. 
Yeah, to make it open to beginners and many more people. Okay. Um, and that was a lot of what is part of your process, because it's one thing to be just have moved the money back and forth, but you're also helping to shape the philosophy of the organization, right? Because you just changed dramatically how it approaches the community as a whole versus just this exclusive to opening it up. So you have that power that goes back to kind of building that type A personality you might want to fill. Um, you also have the power also to put it on. The some of the leadership skills is, is these are true examples of um, quality conversation you can have. Um, the, how many of you are juniors? Or serious, and you think about it going up. So some of you can think about this is my next step. If there are internships going into next year or whatever, these are qual conversations that are actually fairly productive for tangible information. So that's the way you should focus on is how can I get out of the best practices and learn from this. Um, res interviewers love to hear about failure and what you learn from that too. So kind of think about how you may have seen others through this process and what you built upon it. So on that note, well, who has, you've said you've done it before. Give me some examples of where you um, walked into a disaster and you kind of looked at changing things. Anybody? Yeah. Well, actually, this semester, our uh, IPI, the, the martial art part head instructor, got seriously ill and isn't going to be able to teach this semester. So there was a little bit of floundering and fumbling for filling that normal practice spot that we had with her. So that required a lot of communication with the other members and other and, support. And with our instructors to find other instructors who come in later. Yes. Um, I got an email a couple of weeks ago from um, a woman who uh, has, has since graduated, has graduated since she was in a club and is moving out of Boston said, um, hi, I was going through a drawer and I found this stack of checks to the club that never got cashed. And I don't want to tell you guys how much the total added up to you, but it was enough for me to have like a slight heart attack. <laughs> uh, so I have this stack of checks from 2011. Mm -hmm. um, some of the checks are from people that I know because they're still associated with the clubs. So lots of the checks are from people I have no idea who they are. So uh, I mean, some of them I can email and be like, hey, would you be really good to write this check for us? Sorry. Yeah. But a lot of it is just like the lost revenue that we've been spent on activities for the past months. Do you think that's ever happened? You know, that's not I'm the sure first time I've heard that, time. I'm sorry to say. So, so how do you, so these are real examples. Um, so how would you prevent that in the future? Um, that's, a, that's a really useful question. I mean, to some degree, there's going to be turnover uh, and the best practices that I'm trying to put in place as a club leader this year may or may not be around in two years. Um, but um, well, having, like, like, one, like one thing I, I would like to do this year is have everyone who's in a leadership or an officer position sort of keep track of what the responsibilities are for that position mm -hmm. in order to pass along like an awareness of responsibility and also just like stuff you need to do throughout the year. Yep. And so for example, That's for that good. position, for that officer, like hopefully when, when that position gets passed on to the next person, one of the things will be, remember to pass any checks along to the club treasurer like before the end of the year. You know? that's, that's a good point. So who here just got handed a pile of material from their former treasurer officers and said, deal with it? Not knowing, he said, full package of checks. What did you feel like?
and I'm sure everybody in the room can probably continue on it. So share with me anything that they think they walked into an actually good situation or that you personally have started to build up on. Anybody? Who were yeah. um, So I got a message from Flash Treasure, and she had one of those, like, like accordion folders. Okay. So, who here out of the organization clubs that have um, a track record, either full documentation of past expenses or even more history, like this is the, this is the time you should be doing this type of logistics, a schedule, a communication, planning? We got two. So the rest of you are shooting in the dark and hoping to fail. Does an old uh, two old folders of receipts count? No, that would be up there on the Elvis scale. And unless you know what, unless the folder is actually, I mean, and this is all, so the folder of receipts or folder of a pile of stuff, what do you, does that, other people fall into that same category of having just no clue on what's been spent in the past? I mean, is that what it seemed like? It was just a pile of receipts and you don't know what it's attributed to? Mm -hmm. So how, I mean, one of the things that was pretty exciting is it's planned to, Reevaluate what you've done in the past, whether it's expanding it to new individuals. I mean, you all, do you have plans going into this academic year? Or do you just want to do what other people have done? Because part of the benefit, and she, I mean, you're kind of kidding being Napoleon, but you're taking on that leadership. You have the, the ability to change and make an impact on this organization and do whatever. And I think that was pretty exciting, expanding it more. But the benefit, the reason you have to kind of have a plan, or at least know what you've said, is you can't just wing something as dramatic as I'm going to do a whole um, change of the number of individuals in 10 groups, because you don't know how much it's going to cost without having historical records. And having that information, pacing it together, really makes a big impact. I put up a bunch of case studies. Anybody ever ran into any of these personally as managing the club finances? First, debit card, somebody bought, somebody bought using the debit card from a club and either bought stuff at the, their house, yeah? Um, well, I have run into a situation where we're really low on funds, so it wanted a bunch of the funds that were there Handbook, right? Has anybody read it? No one's got it. Okay, so I point this out because there's that financial, and this is the rest. Anytime you are on a board of any sense, you are legally then becoming um, financially responsible. Whether it's a nonprofit board or a corporate board, or you're, fine, you're in charge, you become president of the organization, CFO, whatever it happens to be, same similar accident. You are fiduciary responsible to that well being of that organization. So understanding how to manage it and what's the checks and balances in this safer environment makes a big, this is a good place to build up best practices. Because the last thing you want to do is venture out in the real world or in the big dollars and find yourself running a nonprofit and it's going under because the financials aren't in the same concept and aren't as controlled as you think they should be. So you are Harvard University will not be responsible for and must not be made par party to or liable for payments of debts and financial obligations entered into other places. So if you basically are spending more than you really end up and you run in a deficit and you owe creditors, whether it's 
referees or bands that you're using, you personally as officers are liable. So that's why that gets, I put that out there, because that is part of it. That's anybody who is a member of a nonprofit, you're initially fiduciary responsible for that organization. Right. So how do you avoid that? Have a plan. This is in, understand what you're going to ex expense. One of the benefits of having all the accounts at the credit union is you can look back. We can get access to historical transactions for the last 12 months and beyond. So if you're really trying to piece it through a bunch of receipts or checks that have not been cashed, we have the ability to help you recreate it if necessary. But you need to put in place um, checks and balances. Who here has this type of thing where two officers must sign off on expenses? Why do you think, what, has it helped? It's, yeah, it's helped from you know, making sure that we're all on the same page and we're checking the room. Right. Um, yeah, great. Anybody else? Who thinks of pain in that? Anybody else? No, me. What? Anybody else thinks it's positive? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, like, oh. log logistically, it can be, like, sort of annoying sometimes, right, to, like, write a check to somebody and say, go get it signed by this other individual. But, like, from a, like, organizational standpoint, I think it makes a lot of sense for, like, the captain and the treasurer to be on the same page whenever expenditures are being logged. So to repeat, that having at least two officers on the same page when, um, about expenses and what's important is really critical. Um, so you don't have an individual who's going up, to, taking that debit card and going and saying, hey, I think I need to buy this new, whatever happens to be club equipment, and finding out, well, we already spent that because we're already playing this other aspect. So it seems really pretty clear to me that with checks, you can just you know, have two people sign it. But like, do you have any suggestions I personally, I will tell you, this is, an, I'm, a, I'm a broken record in this, but um, I'm not a fan of debit cards for clubs. Yeah, but um, for some so, things like for ordering equipment online, like a lot of yeah. recommend, it's if like I did it, everybody probably has a debit card of their own, and secondarily, everybody has, most people have credit cards, most of you, if you're 21, you probably do have credit So very rarely do they run into expenses. Um, there's a lot more protection on purchasing things with a credit card online than there is with a debit card. And there's no um, checks and balances. I am not a fan. HBS Student Clubs does not allow their officers to have debit cards. They only allow ATM deposit. Um, so that is something I want to be very. You, it's your decision at your club. But I want to tell you from the checks and balances, one area we have risk. So, it is planning, having the budget, and kind of keeping track. I'm not gonna, this will be online. But one of the things is really, you're recreating. You're, one, you're setting up a policy for yourself and plans. So go in and say, have, who here has said, and met with your other officers and said, I, this is my plan for the next six months, nine months. This is what we want to do as a group, one. Anybody else? Two. I think you, it's a healthy exercise to meet with at least the leaders of the individual organization, club, and say, this is what we're gonna do. These are the events, this is the tournaments we wanna participate in, and then back out and say, well, how much is it gonna cost? Because nothing's free, a lot of this is expensive, and then you figure out, well, what, this is what we have available, this is the fees, dues, whatever, yes? So a quick question about the debit card point. Um, just to be clear, is the alternative to have members pay for it and then just give them a check? Yep. Or check, or you can do a transfer online. Yes, I do not, because there isn't a business in this world that would, Bill Gates, when he was running uh, Microsoft, did not have it, a direct debit card to the Microsoft funds. He had a, I'm pretty sure Microsoft isn't. Well, any organization. Out of pocket, and that's it, kind of tough on any organization is that checks and balances. You need a, that sense from that. Right? And that's where, unlike, so a debit card, you give them free right. I, I'm not going to is they can charge anything. They have full authority to charge up to the maximum possible. There isn't that checks and balances, and it's instantaneous. So that's why I'm, I do get hesitant. I have no best practices on that. So document, find out why you're gonna spend, and you can reimburse, you can forward advance. You can always advance fund somebody if they need it. Um, if you're, say, running into a big expense, you can say, well, you can prepay, you can do, do it off your personal debit card, we'll put in X amount 
for this for this transaction, and a lot of it can be done. There's plenty of ways to get that in control. So this will be questions, opportunity for questions and answers at the end. But I really do recommend best practices understanding what your income was last year and expenses and what your plans will be, and really tracking online banking. You have real time access to the information, and there's also information in this book about best practices. So, all right, I will leave this. I try to keep it on point. So understand, I mean, you all know how to do bet, checks and balances and write a pay bill. But if you need assistance with setting up online banking or assistance with reconciling your accounts from last year, we are more than happy to help. Because we understand you want to be new, you want to make it a successful year, and that's our role and our benefit is we have that history of information, both from your student organization, student club account, as well as best practices from other organizations. So. Anything, any last questions? Um, so now I would like to introduce um, Tim Wheaton, Associate Director of Athletics, and Jennifer Downing, Assistant Director of Athletics, Stewardship, and Alumni Relations. <coughs> we are going to talk about fundraising. Hi. Thanks. Hang on. You get a bike. <coughs> you get a bike. talked a little bit about um, how to be careful with spending money, and now we'll talk a little bit about how we can get some money to spend. Um, we, uh, have, we're going to give a similar talk to what we gave last year, so uh, we'll move through it quickly, but I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to uh, ask questions if you need to. All right? So, um, the biggest thing to understand about fundraising is that it's about relationships, right? What you're trying to do is get people, whether they're part of your community, people who participated in your organization before, people in the general community, you know, friends and family of, the, of, of your club, to be enthusiastic enough and feel connected enough with your organization that they want to support you um, by cheering you on, but also um, by helping you financially, right? So. Uh, Making those relationships is going to be the key to everything we talk about. Right. Um, so, uh, as was just mentioned to you, right? It's a student-run organization, and we provide some structure and some support. But ultimately, you guys are responsible for your organization. That has some great benefit for you guys. Some responsibility that we just heard. Right? But some benefit as well. You learn a lot of things and are able to do a bunch of things which will serve you well as you go forward. Um, one of the keys for this, um, for you guys to make sure things happen well, and again it was alluded to before, is, is uh, consistency and transition. Right? Um, are we going to have these slides available for people? So you guys, these slides, I see some people typing this. You may be just writing text to people. That's totally fine. But you'll have access to these, so you don't have to try to copy anything that's up there. Um, we uh, is making sure that uh, there's communication between outgoing leadership and incoming leadership so that we can have some consistency going forward um, so that the, we're not reinventing the wheel every year. It's one of the things that we see happen over and over again in, uh, in club groups, especially when it comes to fundraising, is that we have a group that gets excited, contacts people, starts the process, and then it kind of dies and then starts up again. Um, so we want to make sure that we have some consistency, communicate with each other going forward. How many of your organizations have a person specifically responsible for fundraising? Okay, how many people have that person as a, someone who's different than your treasurer? Good. It's not a bad idea to have a person, a different person earning it and responsible for how it gets, how it gets spent. All right? Because um, it can be a very time-consuming uh, part of the process, right? As you all know, you guys are busy students and you do this for pa your passion and dividing the work among a number, a number of people is important. Um, 
the one of the key groups that we want to encourage you to uh, to build, if you don't have it, and I'll ask that question in a second, is what we call our friends group. And you can read about them in, in sports pages, booster groups, etc. At Harvard, we call them friends groups, and they're people uh, primarily made up of uh, alums, former participants, but also anyone who has an interest in uh, in your organization. How many of you feel like you have uh, an existing uh, email list, contact list for a, what we might call a friends group for your group? It's probably somewhere, right? <laughs> It exists somewhere. That's fantastic. Anybody, did, are any of you involved in building those lists? Yeah? How did you build it? What did you do? What's, what group did you? Um, Club Field Hockey. Club Field Hockey. And we just made a newsletter that we're trying to disperse and first That's one of the key ways to have it happen. There's a, I'm old, much significantly older than all of you guys. I used to be all commercial about, and she told two friends, and she told two friends. You ever see that commercial? Right? And that's kind of how you do it. If you can talk to your seniors to get them to talk to people who were seniors when they were freshmen, and get them to talk to people who were seniors when they were freshmen, it's not very difficult to connect through the history of the program. You know, who was on, you talked to someone who graduated two years ago. Who was everyone on your team? And then you find the oldest person on that group and ask, and you can build it gradually that way. All right? Asking when you send newsletters out, put a little line in there saying, especially if it's email, please feel free to forward to anyone who might be interested. So it's like, oh, I saw that Jim wasn't on the club soccer list, and he was my buddy and teammate, and I'm going to send it on to him so we can build it that way. All right? Um, so record keeping, current and recent rosters, again, one of the things I know that Casey will talk to you guys about this for other reasons, but having an active, accurate roster of the current team is really, really valuable. It's important to us for all sorts of reasons. Safety when you go on the road, to have an idea of where you are, who's going, uh, record keeping for all sorts of stuff, but it also can serve as the basis for this friends group going forward. Right? We can pull that roster and say, this is everyone on the team this year, and last year, and 10 years ago, etc. So if you don't have that process, Start that process. You know, get a roster, get an active roster with uh, communications upon them. Um, can you back mm -hmm. uh, We talked about that building list. Great, thanks. Um, so communication. Um, we all know that we're incredi incredibly crass, shallow, selfish individuals, and all we really want from these people is their money, right? Shh. We want to fool them, right? We want to make sure. You know, that's not true, and I'm just kidding, right? Um, we, if the only time you're communicating to this group, this friends group, is when you're asking them for something, you're not nearly going to be as effective as you want to be. You want to make sure that you are keeping them informed, that they're happy to receive that newsletter from you, that email, that says, hey, we had a big game this weekend. We did this, we did that. You know, this is how it went. Fantastic. And then you build. Yes, you might have a little paragraph on the bottom of any e email or newsletter that says, you know, we appreciate your support. Please forward any donation to X, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But an actual, like, hey, guys, this is our solicitation. We need to make our budget this year. Please help us. Should happen as a, at a very specific um, uh, time, which we'll talk about, uh, and shouldn't be the focus of all your, of all your newsletters. Um, you are far more adept at all this stuff than I will ever be. I have a nine-year-old who grabs my phone out of my hand and teaches me how to use it when he gets frustrated that it takes too long all the time. Uh, so whatever tools you have right, what, to communicate, use. I won't even start to name them because I'll use things that are already updated. right? But whatever you do, basically it's just about communication. Getting in touch with people, letting people know. It's um, One of the ways I want you to think about it is think about your high school organization. You know, you played on a team, you were part of a band, you did whatever. Are you unhappy to hear from them about how things are going? When it's like, you know, you hear from your high school field hockey team that, hey, we got a big game and we won. It's like, cool, it's fun to hear. It doesn't bother you. Often, people in your shoes feel uncomfortable communicating. Oh, they don't want to hear from us, right? We're just bothering them. But think of it the other way, right? You're happy to hear from groups you left. And often, 
people are happy to hear from you about how their club that was important to them when they were undergrads, um, how they're doing. So communicate those stuff. You have a lot of little things to talk about. Um, so do it. I'm sure they're hearing from you. Okay. Um, so solicitation. Uh, there are two different main kinds for it. One is annual giving, right? You have an annual budget. Some of them are very small, some of them are very large. You want to meet those needs, right? You want to make sure that if it costs us $2,000 a year to run a program, that we have $2,000 a year coming into our program every year. So that's annual giving. You want to get that every year. You want to get people consistently giving. That I'm getting used to every year. I write a check for $100 to club field hockey, right? Important part of, uh, of what I did. I really like that, like that program. The people who are running now are really active. I really want to support it. I write a $100 check. Bang. Fantastic. The other piece that we'll have is occasionally you might have significant things. We just made nationals, right? We need to, we need to raise $10,000 to go to Pittsburgh for nationals, right? Kind of capital giving, right? A larger lump sum. That is easy. You qualify for nationals, you lead up to it, you say we've got this specific uh, goal and we, uh, we ask specifically for it. Those are easier to do if we built a relationship. Right? That people are hearing from you generally. All right? So with annual giving, we're creating the habit of giving. We're trying to get people to participate. Some people do uh, creative things to get people used to writing a check no matter how small. There's a lot of evidence that shows that people who give small checks end up giving bigger checks. If you wait till someone, you know, till their startup goes public. Right. Or until they get that big promotion to ask them to start writing checks, they're not going to write checks. What you want them to do is write the check and just move the decimal point over as they get older and older and wealthier. Right? So if you can get someone to go write a $5 check, write a $10 check, right? even people who are just graduating, you know, get people in a habit. There are some groups that do a senior gift. Can we get the seniors who are graduating to give a small gift to our club and get them in the habit of doing things? Can you get young alums? Can you target people in different groups? Say, can we get the five most recent graduating classes to give a small um, target amount? To get them used to writing a check. The more people are writing a check, the more habitual it will be, and uh, it will help you as you go forward. Timing, um, certainly there's the, the tax year, so getting, uh, making requests before uh, the start of the new year where people can get credit, and we'll talk a little bit about um, how we can do that so all you guys can get, anyone who makes a donation to your friends group can get a uh, tax credit for making that gift. That includes, there's some caveats, but that includes the parent who writes the dues, right, can write it to the friends group and get credit as though that was a donation and not dues. So that's not the worst thing in the world for your tax paying families, right? Okay, so tax time, academic fiscal year, right? People go, oh, start of the school year, the club's starting up, you want to write something, you want to do something there, right? Um, and your season, right? You're a spring season, we're just about to start. Hey, alums, we're just about to start up our season, we're playing lacrosse, we're just getting started. Uh, as we look to our season, this is what we look to, look to, um, to do, and this is how much it's going to cost us, hope you can do it. So they keep, things resonate. Right? And then the capital stuff, where it's we just made nationals or whatever, again, that's obvious based on your own timing that we're going to make, we can make that larger request. All right, so you need to think a little bit about some of the broader things that are just general, tax year, academic year, and some of the specific things. What makes the most sense for you guys to have the focus? All right? Uh, so, ways to get. Who has been on the Go Crimson website? All right, it should be a great tool for you guys. Each t club is listed there, right? So you can tell someone, go to Go Crimson, click on Support Harvard Athletics, right? Make a gift online, find your club sport in the drop-down menu, and online they can make a donation which will credit, go credited to your team, right? With no processing of checks by you, no taking mail, no finding a pile of checks in someone's drawer from 2011. That's when it was, right? I was I'm just trying to demonstrate that I was actually listening when you were speaking. Right. There you go. Okay? So that works. So that can be really helpful. People can write checks, right? To your friends group, friends of your club's work. One of the key words 
for some of you, is the word club. Right? So if someone writes a check to friends of field hockey, you ain't getting it. <laughs> All right? We have a field hockey club, and the people who are processing it will do the best job they can, but it, try to remind people to put in club when it's, uh, especially for those of you who have partnered um, uh, varsity program. Okay? But so we can make it easy for people to donate. All right? Okay, chime in briefly. Of course. For the, the online gifts, if you go to the drop down and you don't see your club listed there, it means you do not have a fundraising account set up because you've not received any gifts yet. So in order to get your club listed in the drop down, you need to have someone send an initial check. That will create the account, and then your club will be listed. Most of your clubs, if they've been around long enough, they have received at least one gift, and you should be listed. But for some of the newer clubs, you may not be in the drop down yet. If that's a situation for us, please let us let know. Us know. We're going to make that as easy as possible to happen. Okay? Yeah. All right, so we are under Go Crimson, and this is the support page under Give Online. And under Athletics Designation, you're going to go to the club sports. And then here is a list of all of the club teams that currently have an account. So if you're not listed there, it means you haven't received any gifts yet. But we can fix that if you get someone to write a check. So please let us know. And then you can have people select dollar amounts. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so mail, drop it off to Casey, mail it in, we can do all those things. All right. Uh, we talked about this uh, a little bit about major needs, you know, nationals, equipment, et cetera, et cetera. All right, be specific, plan ahead, right, as much as you can, plan ahead. Um, yes. Um, it's important that when you get donations, for all sorts of reasons, some for your own protection, some for people to get tax credit, some for our own accounting, that donations not get de uh, deposited directly into the credit union account. Donations could, could, should come through the athletic department, and then we can move money from there into the credit union, union account. You want some record for your protection, right, that that donation has been deposited appropriately. You will get access to money, that's not the issue. It's a matter of making sure that we can keep track of where things are and that everyone is, you know, if something goes missing or whatever, that things are covered. Um, okay, so donations go into the um, department. university, to the department, and then and get, we can get transfer cash from the department to the credit union to have access to the All right, uh, thank you. Crucial, crucial, crucial part of this. You can, yes, yeah, sorry, go. Yeah, so you, there's a bunch of ways. You can go directly online, and you can check with us to do it. You can have, give them the address and stuff and have them write a check and send it in, and you can check with us so we know that it's deposited to the athletic, to the athletic department. You can also, if they, you know, someone wants to hand your check in a game, you can bring it in and hand it to Casey and we'll deposit it. All right? But yeah, they can mail directly. All right, uh, thank yous. Crucial, crucial, crucial part of this. We should be thanking early and often. Right? Someone makes a donation. This is a piece that the more you can formalize it, the more you can automate it, uh, the better. This is a piece that falls through the cracks and people get very, very upset. Right? You've asked someone, basically you've asked someone to do you a favor. Right? Please help me. How do you feel when someone asks you to do you a them to do you a favor, you to do them a favor, and they walk away without thanking you for doing it. Happy, happy? Eager to help them again? Not usually, right? So thank. So there are different ways to do this, and often, right, organizations have different methods of thanking based on the amount of giving, 
right? It's not practical to give everybody gives a $10 gift, a free a t-shirt as a thank you. Not a good business plan, let me tell you, all right? Okay? Um, so setting up uh, an idea that says, okay, for an amount up to this number, right, we may send an email thank you. And an amount above that to the next highest tier, we might send a handwritten note, right? For something beyond that, we might call or send a gift, right? Um, and those numbers, the reason I'm not saying specific numbers is they're very, very different for all sorts of organizations, right? If you're trying to raise $1,000, then gifts of $100 are very significant. If you're trying to raise $100,000, right, you might not write a thank, handwritten thank you note for a $100 gift, right? Your tiers may be different, so you have to kind of determine where they are. But thanking and thanking often. Think about creative ways to thank, right? Different people, different ways to do it. Creative ways that are uh, emblematic of your um, activity, right? Signed soccer ball, right? Uh, corner flag, I'm a soccer guy, sorry. You know, little things that represent your activity, your sport, that might mean something to them for significant gifts. Think of broadly thanking. So it's nice if the president writes a handwritten note. That's fantastic. It's great if that note is signed by every member of the team, right? Because the team, it mattered to all of us, and we took the time to write this, right? It's great if people hear periodically from different members of your team. All right, so just thank, be creative as often as you can. All right. Um, yeah, a little bit more on that. Uh, you, each club will give Casey the contact person, and once a month you'll be receiving an Excel spreadsheet that lists all the gifts that your your club has received. And that list will come from the varsity club to whomever you've appointed as your contact. So Casey will be in touch with you to collect the name, whether it's the treasurer or the president or someone else you've appointed. But you'll be getting a monthly report of all the gifts that have come in with email addresses so that you'll know who your donors are. And then you can choose whether you email them, send a handwritten note, send a signed uh, soccer ball or whatever you choose. So we will be providing you with a list of donors on a monthly basis, but please make sure that whomever is the point person on your, your club, keep that information and make sure that the thank you notes happen. So Casey will be in touch. Okay. Uh, this is the last slide. Yeah, last slide. So again, student run organization. Um, I will reiterate a little bit what was said earlier. There are risks and benefits, right? It's great to have a student-run organization. You guys learn all sorts of stuff, but you have responsibility. And I will tell you, I've been here a very long time, and during my tenure here, there are, have been Harvard students sent to jail, sent to federal prison for their handling of club funds. Okay? I don't think that's going to happen to anybody else, and it hasn't happened in a long, long time, but you are responsible, right? You are responsible. So think about things to protect yourself and protect your club's resources. I will also say this is not relevant to what we're discussing right now, but uh, resources go beyond money, right? So the club soccer team uses club money to buy 25 soccer balls, right? Where they go over the summer, right? I, they're in my basement. Uh, <laughs> all right, um, right. There's a you have a responsibility. And some of you guys, the rifle club, some of our martial arts club have expensive equipment, swords, things like that. It's important that it's purchased by club money, that it belongs to the club, and it's kept track of. We had a situation with a, a, one of our firearms clubs where we were contacted by an alum about three shotguns which were worth thousands and thousands of dollars a piece that had just gone missing. And fortunately, they'd been lent with the police department so they knew where they were, but they would have just been gone. So we need to make sure that we take care of that stuff. So that's information you pass from person to person and responsibility for free items. All right, sorry for that sidetrack. Um, part of the larger department, we are here to help you. There are things we can do to assist you. So I don't know, 
we just had a meeting with uh, some of our corporate sponsors for the department, one of whom makes stuff, printed stuff, t-shirts, foam fingers, cups, balls, all sorts of stuff like that. We have some material for you here for you to take advantage of Harvard's broader access to some of those things. So if you do want to you know, make a giveaway as a fundraiser or whatever, we have the opportunities to help you, you do some of those things. So we are part of a larger organization that can support you. Um, consistency, right? That we want to get a program that works. You mentioned this before. It works in both ways. It works about kind of a financial consistency in terms of spending your money, but also in terms of bringing money in. You should sit down with your leadership and go, this is what we're going to do. October 1st, we're going to send a letter that has our upcoming schedule, right, and an introduction of our, of our team. Uh, you know, we're going to send after every game, we're going to send a quick Twitter tweet, 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 here you go, tweet, uh, right, about the game results. And then, but you get the idea that we're going through, we're going to have a major, our major ask is going to be the beginning of January, because that's going into nationals, the beginning we go all the way through, so we have a thing, we know what's happening, the new person can take over and go, this is our schedule, and what happens. Different for different teams, organized in different ways, but that consistency helps. Um, uh, again, and the ask is part of a larger community building effort. It's great to have people writing checks for you and supporting you. It's a great feeling. I will tell you, it's as great to hear that kid who graduated three years ago whooping and hollering on, your, on the sidelines of your game because they came to watch you play. It's a great feeling, right? To have them come out there and support you. We build that community in a lot of different ways, right? We build a community in a lot of different ways. But it's got to be built. It can't be just, we need money, help. We want to build that relationship as we go forward. All right? Do we have any questions? Any ways we can help you? Okay. Yes, sir. So what about Football. for, for clubs, uh, the billiards club. Uh, so what about for clubs that don't have an extensive alumni network? And uh, it doesn't really make sense to kind of have this funnel because we don't have enough people to just reach out to at the moment. Are there like specific pots of money that we might not know about that we should know about? So there are a couple of things. One I think does make sense that even though maybe a small group, you want to build that, and you can broadly define friends. Remember, it's not just alums. So there are people who are interested in billiards in general around here, right? They're, so looking at those organizations about getting started and having people who are um, uh, want to support. We have a, a gentleman who supports a golf activity here who never did anything with golf here, just as an older person, loves golf. Right? And said, I wish I had had this opportunity when I was an undergrad, so I want to help other people do it. So you may find people like that. So just building. So, but I take your point. Right? There are also um, opportunities to get resources from commercial entities, although we need to do that very, very carefully in terms of how we do it. But certainly we have some of our clubs that receive some funding from other commercial entities, a billiard manufacturer, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to be careful how we do that. And Gary can talk to you about the specifics. But we do certainly have people who do that. As you know, Harvard is very sensitive about their name and linked with, with the commercial activities. But I will say that I still think it's a great idea to just build it. So maybe for the first couple of years, your friend group is the guy who graduated last year, your parents, your grandmother, your brother, you know, all those guys. And it's a small group. But remember, a small group has smaller needs as well, right? But build it slowly and have people used to it. Right? Anyone else? Right? Please, please, please. Build those lists. Build that relationship. Right? Have contact people who graduated. Ask them for contacts of people they played with. The, better, the more robust and accurate a list you have, the easier all this stuff is going to be for you. And your, um, the people who follow in your footsteps will thank you many times over. All right? Because it makes their life much easier to be able to drop an email and say, this moves to the people who love us, makes life much, much easier. Right? Anything else you need from me? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, guys. Good luck this season. Does anyone have any questions for Tom? You know, we kind of jumped into it. If anyone's the new officer and wants to sign the new signature, we'll just like that today. So you're going to head off to the bridge. So as an officer, if you're transitioning as the new officer, we have to fill out a signature. Information is going to put you in the 
Thank you. Um, can I say one more thing about stuff? Gary's going to smack me. All right? <laughs> yeah, turn the film off. Um, when I say we're here to help, I mean that. And I hope that you will at least ask for help. So what are some common things that you guys do in the athletic department does as a whole? So we fundraise. What else do we do? We buy stuff. Right? We buy soccer balls and field hockey sticks and you know lacrosse jerseys and all sorts of stuff. Because of that, we have lots of relationships with people. We may not be able to help all the time, but if you're like, hey, you know, lacrosse wants to buy new uniforms, we might at the very least be able to put you in touch with someone that can help you out and give you a better price. Right? It doesn't hurt to ask the question. All right? So let us help take advantage of being a part of this larger institution. Yeah. Thank you, thank you.